Good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday, February the 23rd, 2021. It is currently 7.41 a.m. I'm coming to you live from Victory Baptist Church located here in Ovalo, Texas. And once again, I have right here next to me a copy of The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. And well, we're going to use this Tuesday morning, early Tuesday morning, to spend some time considering what Thomas Akempis has to say in chapter 21 of book one. Remember, The Imitation of Christ is broken down into different books. We're still in book one. We're in chapter 21. And today we're going to turn our attention to the subject of contrition, contrition of heart. That's the title of the book that I have. Okay, I was looking at my iPad. Notification just went out that I'm going live on the air, so that's good. Um, Sometimes those notifications work. Sometimes they don't. Hopefully you get the notifications when I'm live on the air. Hopefully you do so. Um, But yes, good morning. Welcome. Contrition of Heart is the name of the chapter, book one, chapter 21 of the book of the Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. If you haven't been with us with our study of the previous 20 chapters, you've missed a lot. It's had a lot of twists. It's had a lot of turns. Some of them have been good. Some of them have been bad, but I hope they've all been beneficial in some way, shape, or form. It's the way I'm approaching the book is probably uh, not what a lot of people would would like because you're like, you know, I'm already ready to move on, but I'm I'm just working through the book. um, And hopefully, Hopefully you've got a copy. If you if you need a copy of the Imitation of Christ by Thomas Kempis, they're easy to find. And uh, yeah, there's you can uh, you can uh, if you go to uh, the theologycentral.net pod page, go to theologycentral.net. That's theologycentral.net. Theology Central all run together. Theologycentral.net. Go to the blog section. You have to scroll down a few entries, but look for the blog uh, post. Uh, on uh, the Theology Central Book Club. There'll be a link. Go to the Theology Central Book Club. It'll show you the book that we're currently reading, which is The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. You can click on that. You can purchase a digital copy, or you can look for a physical copy if you want. They're, they're all physical and digital. They're, they're relatively cheap. The Imitation of Christ has been around for, uh, you know, the book The Imitation of Christ has been around for so long. Such a classic book, so popular that there's all kinds of different translations and it comes in all kinds of different versions. And, and, and when I say versions, like they may add that you have some that they'll add, you know, like study notes, some, you know, there, there's just all kinds of different ways of, of finding a copy. So find a copy, join us. Even if you're like, well, I've missed the, the previous uh, 20 chapters. That's okay. Just join us, start where we are right now. And then you can go back at a later time. But let's just jump in. It's been, say, when was the last time we studied the imitation of Christ? Let me look here. It's been, it's been too long. And I apologize for that. Yeah, I, I've been getting very frustrated with myself because I, I, there's so much that I need to do that I just keep, you know, I I get mad at myself that I keep adding new things, you know, oh, let's do this. Let's do this. uh, Because I, there's always more that I, there's more, I, there's always more to do than I have time to do, if that makes any sense. In other words, um, I, every day I can come up with, oh, I should do this and, oh, I should do this and I should start a series on this and, oh, we should work on this and we should work on that. And while I'm coming up with all of these ideas, then you just got the normal things happening in our world that then leads me to come here and then say, okay, we got to focus on this now. Well, those, those current events, those current situations those then push aside the other things I was working on and it just starts all piling up. And sometimes I feel like I'm drowning. I really need like, you know, I just need to be able to sit here for 24 hours a day. (laughs) That's what I need. But I can't obviously do that because I have other responsibilities and other things I need to do. But I hope, I I hope, most of you are very gracious uh, with the fact that I don't always do things probably I don't always make the best choices and how I organize things and all the different series that I start, but hopefully, uh, I think most of you are, have been very gracious. Maybe, maybe you haven't been, you've been gracious to me. Maybe you're at home going, you know, that guy's an idiot. And, and maybe, and you're probably right. You're probably right. But the last time we uh, studied uh, The Imitation of Christ was February the 2nd, 2021. And what, today is the 23rd. So yes, that's that's a, a, a very long uh, gap right there. And of course, there's been... 
Texas did get hit with 14.8 inches of snow here in the local area, and we lost power and water. So, yeah, there's some things that are beyond my control, you know. Uh, so, yes. And, and, the, and the last episode, I just I talked about a James saying, hey, we can't say tomorrow I'm going to do this. Tomorrow I'm going to do this because tomorrow is not guaranteed if the Lord will. So I'm here today. So let's make use of this time today. Are you ready? Imitation of Christ, if you can open up your copy, great. If you can't, well, then you've got to listen to me read, all right? Here we go. Let's just jump in. Uh, Well, in fact, let's do this. Uh, Chapter 21 of the Imitation of Christ is called Contrition of Heart. Contrition of Heart. So you know what we need to do. Let's do this. Contrition of Heart. Let's let's look up the definition for the word contrition. I think that would be a good exercise. I had looked it up, and obviously I closed it out, which makes no sense. Here we go. (laughs) Contrition. Let's look up contrition. Uh, The word contrition is defined as the state of feeling remorseful and penitent. All right? In the Roman Catholic Church, the repentance of past sins during or after confession. All right? Contrition. Now, please note, in the Roman Catholic Church, the repentance of past sins during or after confession prayers of contrition. Now, remember, Thomas Akempis is coming from a Catholic perspective, so we'll have to keep that in mind and see if we, we, may, want, uh, we may have to do some uh, work in the Catholic catechism. We, we, may, we may have to go back to that. I didn't even think of it from that perspective. Uh, I should have, and now I realize, wait, well, I, may, I may be approaching this the wrong way, so we may have to change my approach immediately, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can accomplish in this episode, all right? But this, this could open a door for a lot of different studies, so we will see. So again, contrition, let's just go with the basic idea, the state of feeling remorseful and penitent. Um, right here, I just looked up contrition on, on, on a Google search bar. That's the first definition, but over here to the right, they have this. In Christianity, contrition is repentance for sins one has committed. The remorseful person is said to be contrite. A central concept in much of Christianity, contrition is regarded as the first step step through Christ towards reconciliation with God. So they're saying within Christianity, Contrition is regarded as the first step through Jesus Christ towards reconciliation with God. That contrition is the very beginning of, in a sense, our, 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 our first steps towards God and our, our first steps in our Christian life. It is contrition, this remor- remorsefulness, that is sorrow, that is brokenness over our sin. Contrition of heart. Let's see how Thomas Akempis approaches this. Contrition of heart is the title of the chapter, and this is how he begins this chapter. If you will make any progress, keep yourself in the fear of God. Let's stop right here. Thomas Akempis wants you and I to know that if we're going to make any progress in our Christian life, we have to keep ourselves in the fear of God. That's an interesting concept. Now, we, we talk about fearing God. Thomas Akempis puts the emphasis on keeping yourself in the fear of God. In other words, you may fear God today. There's no guarantee you're going to be fear, fearing God tomorrow. You have to work to keep yourself in the fear of God. That is a very interesting concept. My, my translation of the Imitation of Christ, they provide in parentheses here, Proverbs 19.23. All right. Let's, let's look at this. Proverbs 19.23. Let's see what is stated here. Proverbs 19.23. Proverbs 19.23 reads this. This is Proverbs 19.23. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it, hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. So the fear of the Lord tendeth to life, And he that hath it, who has the fear of God, shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. All right. Now, the bottom line here, though, is that we that the fear of the Lord is the thing that tends to life. And we have to and if we're going to make progress in our spiritual life, we have to keep ourselves in the fear of God. We have to keep ourselves in the fear of God. Now, we could just stop right here. And really, we could just stop. (laughs) 
say, all right, we don't need to go any further because right there, like if we had a, and this is, this is, this is where um, I, I like doing this in a live broadcast, but this is where I really wish people were present. All right. Because if people were present, I would say, okay, I, you know, what I want you to do right now is stop and take out a piece of paper. And I want you to write down what are three steps? What are four steps that would be critical in helping you keep yourself in the fear of God. What things do you need to do to keep yourself in the fear of God? What do you need to do to keep yourself in the fear of God? Because it's one thing to say, hey, hey, you're not going to progress in your Christian life unless you keep yourself in the fear of God. It's one thing to say that and everyone will say, amen, I need to fear God. But how do you keep yourself in the fear of God? How do you maintain that state of being, in a sense, in the fear of God, that you're living your life In the fear of God, that your life consists, it has the fear of God in it. How do we do that? I mean, I, 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 I'm not even, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not going to try to even tell you right now. I really want you to think about that. And, and please, by all means, I, I say this over and over and over. I love for you to communicate with me. That, that's really, that not only is it encouraging, it's really what this is designed. I do these things for your benefit, but it's that communication where I think we both, we both learn. You're benefiting me. You're edifying me. You're helping me on my spiritual life, right? You're assisting me. You're ministering to me as I'm trying to minister to you. We're ministering to each other. We're in this together, right? I know that's such a cliche, but we're, we're in the Christian life together. So wh- how, what do you think? Like what? And and you can say, well, I may get the wrong answer. I may have the wrong answer, but how do we keep ourselves in the fear of God? It's something that we all need to strive to do. I've got some immediate thoughts that I could share, but I I don't want to do that right now. I want you to tell me. Because that's how we're progressing the Christian life. The app, look, if we do not fear God correctly, then we will not advance in our spiritual life correctly. I think the I think uh, the fear of the Lord, I mean, it's the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. So we've got to, ma- how do we maintain that? I, I don't know if, do, do, we, do we look at it? I don't, know what, I, don't know if, I don't know if we often look at it as something that we have to maintain. I think we just look at it as a concept. You fear God, okay, yeah, I'm supposed to fear God. But it's, it's kind of a state of being. Am I fearing God right now? If I'm going to progress in my Christian life, I need to not only be fearing God right now, I need to be fearing God six hours from now. I need to be fearing God 24 hours from now, 72 hours from now, six months from now, All right? So let me read this again. If you will make any progress, keep yourself in the fear of God and affect not too much liberty, but restrain all your senses under discipline, and give not yourself over to foolish mirth. And so he seems to, he, he's almost kind of giving us an idea. If you truly want to keep yourself in the fear of God, do not give yourself to too much liberty. Don't focus on giving yourself all this freedom to do this and to do that and to do that. That will not keep you in the fear of God. It says to restrain all your senses under discipline and give not yourself over to foolish mirth. Don't give yourself over to foolish entertainment or you will not keep yourself in the fear of God. Now, again, remember, I have to keep reminding us when we open up this book, I know this book is a classic book. I know people from all theological backgrounds read The Imitation of Christ. It is just widely accepted by everyone, but so many people read it and forget the the historical situation here. This is, Thomas Kempis is a a Catholic monk so we have to see some of this as written from the perspective of a monastery. We, we have to figure out how do these principles apply to your life and my life. So, so let's, let's do it this way. How do you think foolish mirth, that's the word he uses. Uh, in fact, let, let's just do this. Let's look up the word mirth. Let's do this. Let's look up the word mirth. All right? Remember, I like to lead you through these, this process. I don't like just to give you things. I like to, I want you to be a part of the process of learning. Um, amusement, especially as expressed in laughter. So don't give yourself over to foolish amusement. Let's go with that. Foolish amusement that leads to laughter. Don't, don't give yourself over to foolish amusement. So let me ask you, in what ways do you think 
foolish amusement. Negatively impacts your fear of God. How do you think foolish amusement impacts your ability to stay in the fear of the Lord? And what ways is the foolish amusement contradictory or dangerous or damaging to our fear of God? It's an interesting concept because, because he, and he talks about liberty. He talks about liberty. Don't give yourself over to liberty. Don't, don't worry about liberty, liberty, my, my freedom, my rights, that I can do this and I can do that. You may, again, the Bible sometimes speaks of the things you may have the right to do. You may have the liberty to do, but is, is it always beneficial? Is it always helpful? See, what you should focus on a, on a Christian, and I know this is difficult for us to do. It's difficult for all of us to do. Sometimes we focus on, we want to focus on what we can do. Hey, can I do this and and not be sinning? Can I do this? Can I do this? Well, you, there's a lot of things maybe you can do, but how does, the question shouldn't be, can I do it? The question should be, how is it impacting my spiritual progress? I can do this. But is it negatively impacting my spiritual life? We, we do a lot of work, a lot of focus on you can or you can't. You should or you shouldn't. But, but the thing is, is it beneficial to your spiritual life? Now, you may feel that what someone is doing is not beneficial to their spiritual life, but typically you cannot speak for other people. So you, what you need to focus on is not worry. And this is what a lot of people do. You determine that in your spiritual life that you can't do A, B, C, and D because it's not beneficial to you and you believe it's negatively impacting your fear for God. And then here's what you have a tendency to do. You then want to make sure you inform everyone else, oh, you can do that, but I can't do that because um, it negatively impacts my fear for God. And you almost say it in a way of bragging, like, like, hey, you, you're over there doing that, but I, it's almost like, hey, I really know that that's negatively, that's negatively impacting your spiritual life, so you need to really follow me. It almost, we, sometimes we, we almost make some of the things that we do, it, it puffs us up. Let me give you an example. I think it was yesterday, I don't know, and I don't even know where this was posted. Um, it was a discussion. Uh, it, was a, it was a female she was giving her testimony about how, like, b- basically she was in a bad state spiritually. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember all the details of it, but she was in a pretty bad uh, situation. And it almost like she gave that her solution that she came to was that she realized, according to Scripture, she needs to be wearing a head covering. Right. So as a as a female, she needs to be like it's kind of like she wearing like a scarf, kind of the scarf over the head. And that this shows her submission to God. This shows her submission to God. And so this, I guess, as a symbolic reminder to her that she needs to be in submission to God, um, maybe it also shows submission to to men in some way, shape, or form, I guess. I I don't and we can get into the whole head covering argument. But but the, the thing I had the most the thing that bothered me the most about it is one, she felt that this was the solution to all of her spiritual problems. Hey, in other words, hey, if if you're having spiritual problems and you're a woman and you put a head covering on your head and I, and I guess you're all good to go. But what what was to me in the discussion, she had to include a photograph of herself wearing the head covering. And there she was, you know, kind of her head lifted up there. Look, look at me. Look at me now. Maybe she didn't intend it that way. Maybe she didn't, but it came across like, hey, see, now I'm not telling, I'm, and she wasn't definitely coming across telling all the other women, if you're not wearing head coverings, you're in sin. But in a roundabout way, it was like, hey, look at me. See, if your spiritual life is not really good, if things are, what you really need to do is wear a head, a, a head covering to demonstrate your submission to God. Now, look, if that's what you feel you should do, then by all means, you know, we, we could have a discussion over First Corinthians and, and what head coverings are and aren't. We can do that study at some point. I've done studies on it before. But um, the issue is, why do you feel the need to tell everyone else? Why do you feel the need? See, it, and, and a lot of people do this. Oh, oh, you have a television? Well, you know, um, I, I realized that I could not watch TV uh, because it was impacting me negatively and you know, using the words of Thomas Kimmons, I, I couldn't maintain the fear of God by watching television and, and participating in foolish amusement or foolish mirth. I could not do that. Okay, well, that's wonderful that you can't, but why are you telling everyone else? 
Why are you telling everyone? Are you telling everyone else because you believe it's the only way? Are you telling everyone else because now what you have uh, abstaining from really is it's, it's more about puffing you up. See, if it's puffing you up and it's making you arrogant and it's making you spiritually look down on other people, then most likely you're not maintaining the fear of God. What you're maintaining is spiritual pride. See, sometimes we can do the right thing spiritually and the right thing simply becomes then a stumbling block. We're doing the right thing, but because we're doing the right thing, somehow the right thing then becomes a stumbling block in our own spiritual life because we stop fearing God and we start we start um, relying on our own spirituality. In, in other words, our the spiritual good that we do simply becomes a, a source of spiritual pride where we puff our own selves up, look down on everyone else. That is, even though we're doing the right thing, we're doing the right thing, but we end up with the wrong result. I've done that in my spiritual life. I did the, I, I've told the story a thousand times, but, but I mean, sometimes I can only tell the stories. I can only sometimes share my experiences, right? Sometimes uh, people, when a pastor is in a church for a long time, the people get tired of hearing certain sto- stories. And I know as pastors, you, you have to realize when people get tired of that. But at the same time, sometimes all you can share is your experience. And sometimes your experience serves as a good reminder of a lot of very important spiritual principles. So I think there's a spiritual principle here, right? Yes, we need to maintain the fear of God. We have to. And, and, and sometimes maintaining the fear of God is we, as, as he says here, we give up some liberty. We don't do certain things and we don't, maybe we give up foolish mirth. But the problem is that sometimes we can do the right thing and it doesn't lead to the fear of God. It leads to spiritual pride. Let me give you an example. The night I became a Christian, after the revival service, and they had to stop the revival service because I got convicted and basically laid in the pew and started weeping. Um, I mean, I was wailing and they basically stopped the service and gave an altar call. So, I mean, it was, it was a crazy experience the way it, it all happens. It all happened with me. But when it was over, the pastor took me to his office and he handed me the Bible and he said, this is the word of God. And I took that Bible now, I'd already read the Bible before I became a Christian, and the reason I'd already read the Bible is because I wanted to show all the Christian kids at school that they were idiots. Okay, but that's a whole different story. So, but I, now, now I held the Bible, and I was like, this is God's word. And I went home, and you know the story. I stayed up pretty much all night, read the entire New Testament, um, the very first night that I became a Christian. And then I think within, I don't know, within 24 to 48 hours, I'd already read the entire Bible and was already working on my second way, second time through. I think within... I think within three or four days, I'd already read the whole Bible, maybe twice. I mean, and, and four or five days. I mean, I was just basically spending every waking hour reading, 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 reading. Well, what happened? I was reading and reading and reading the Bible, reading the Bible, reading the Bible, listening to every sermon I could listen to. And at church, when they would get, they, they gave this like quarterly, you know, Sunday school curriculum. And I, and I'm like, oh, this is the Sunday school curriculum. Give me that. And I went home and I'm like, okay, this is for the whole quarter. Let's just stay up and just uh, notebook, read, 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 answer question, 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 question. And I was going to town. All right, great. That's, that's godly. That's good. I had a desire for God's word. I was partaking of God's word. As a newborn babe, I was desiring the word of God that I may grow thereby. I was studying it. I was, I was listening to sermons. I was trying to build myself up. But guess what ultimately resulted it was resulted in. It resulted to me coming to Sunday school. And basically, I mean, there's no, there's no nice way of saying this. I was an absolute jerk. I was an absolute jerk because I basically mocked the Sunday school teacher as being an idiot and that she didn't know what she was talking about and why is she teaching Sunday school because I've been saved two weeks. You know, I, I mean, it wasn't two weeks, but how, whatever the time period was. And I know already, I know the Sunday school lesson better than you do. I know this curriculum better than you do. I know all of this better than you. What are you even talking about? Did anyone in the class even actually read this stuff? Because none of you know what you're talking about. And basically, I, I, I was doing the right thing, but it, all it did was puff me up. Now, you may not have such an extreme example, but it can, the same thing can happen to you. You're like, hey, I, I, I'm trying to maintain the fear of God. Well, great that you're maintaining the fear of God and you're giving up certain liberties and you're not pursuing foolish mirth. 
But if you're not careful, then that just becomes your badge of honor. It becomes about you. It doesn't become about God. Well, I tell, I will, I will be dogmatic about this. Once it becomes about you, you're not maintaining the fear of God. You've left the fear of God because the fear of God will keep you humble. The fear of God will keep you from exalting yourself. The fear of God will keep you from trying to let everyone know that you're the example of true godliness. And you, and look, I've seen this in church so many times. It's like, you know, it'll be like you're preaching a certain, I've even, especially in a small church where people are more uh, prone to speak out. Um, I've seen this in, in my, in our church. It's been many years ago, but I, I I don't know what it was. Some some big event. I don't know if it was a Daytona 500. It was a, the MLB playoffs. I, I don't world world soccer World Cup. I don't know. It was some major event, and I mentioned something about it. And of course, you had to have someone in the sanctuary who go. I don't know what you're talking about. Like like they wanted the whole church to know. Like the rest of you may know what he's talking about because the rest of you. You know, you're all worldly and they had to let everyone know in the church know that, hey, I don't know what I, I, I don't know what that is. I don't know. What you, like, if you don't know, then why do you why do you feel the need to tell everyone? It, it's almost a sign that they wanted everyone else to, to know that they don't partake in such worldly amusement. Well, congratulations. That doesn't mean you're more godly than everyone else. And clearly the fact that you feel that you have to let everyone know is more of a sign of spiritual pride than it is a fear of God. Does does that make sense? I I hope that makes sense. So let's read this again. If you will make any progress, keep yourself in the fear of God and affect not too much liberty, but restrain all of your senses under discipline and give not yourself over to foolish mirth. Now, again, we've got to ask the question, we've, we've got to first figure out how does foolish mirth negatively impact us maintaining the fear of God? That's something we all have to ask ourselves. But I just wanted to offer kind of a counterpoint here. I know this is not the point Thomas Akempis is make, but I think it's a warning. You can, you, can main, you can keep yourself from foolish mirth. You can give up liberty, but if you're not careful, you, it, will become, it will become the very stumbling block that doesn't maintain the fear of God, but exalts self. And you've been around Christians who do this. They just seem to got to let everyone know, hey, I wear a head covering. Some of the women with the head covering thing, it becomes like, man, they got to let the whole world know that they wear a head covering. They're not like the rest of those women in the church not wearing a head covering. They, I don't know what's wrong with all these other women. And it's like, and, and sometimes these women will get on this head covering kick and that's all, the only thing that matters. Head covering, head covering, head covering, head covering, head covering, head covering, head covering. It's like, that's it. If, we, if you don't have a head covering, you know, you're, you're Jezebel. If you don't have a head covering, you know, you're, you're three seconds away from the Antichrist. And it's like, man, this head covering thing sure has, for something that's supposed to represent submission to God, humility, being humble, it sure has turned you into an arrogant, condescending, judgmental person. That, that see, even, even if you're right in the head covering, even if you, if you let's say you're 1,000% right in your interpretation of 1 Corinthians, if it leads to so much spiritual arrogance and pride and so much divisiveness, and it doesn't seem to be producing the fruits of the Spirit, is it really keeping you in the fear of God? There's, I've known lots of people who don't, I don't listen to secular music and I don't watch secular movies, but some of them are the most spiritually arrogant jerks you've ever met in your life. I, 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 yeah, so I mean, there, there are a lot there to consider. Let's continue. Give yourself to contrition of heart and you shall find devotion. So give yourself to contrition of heart. Give yourself to contrition of heart. Just as you have to maintain the fear of God, you've got to give yourself to contrition of heart. So let me ask you, let me ask you again, how do you maintain the fear of God and how do you give yourself to contrition? I think the two are linked. If you're in the fear of God, I think you're going to have contrition. If you have contrition, I think you will fear God. That contrition is the painful awareness of your own sinfulness. Look, 
I think the more you fear God, the more you realize, I think you're more aware of your own sin. I, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to draw these two concepts together, right? Here, here's the way it works. If you truly fear God, you're going to be more aware of your sin than other people's sin. I think one of the clear signs that you fear God is you're more aware of your own sin. If you're always aware of everyone else's sin, if when, when someone else, when someone else sins, I don't care if it's a public scam. I don't care what it is. If your first thought is about them and about their sin, and your first thought is to tell everyone about their sin, you don't fear God. Because when you see someone else sin, what you should immediately think about is your own sin and your own failure. If all you can think about is them and how bad they messed up, and all you want to do is talk about them, what you should do is, woe is me. Because whenever, no matter how bad it is, you've got your own sin. Everyone else's sin, everyone else's failure should be a reminder of your own sin and your own failure. That's the fear of God makes you more aware of your own. And when you fear God, then you should be filled with contrition. I don't think there is contrition without the fear of God. I think contrition makes you fear God. And I think fear, fear God brings about contrition. I think it's like a circle. Fearing God leads to contrition, and the more con contrite of heart you are, the more you fear God, because the more you become aware of your sin, you, look, the more you're aware of your sin, the more you become, you, you realize how, how God, how holy God is, and the more you're aware of God's holiness, the more you realize how sinful you are. The fear of God leads to contrition. Contrition leads to more fear of God. The more aware you are of your sin, the more you fear God. Because you realize you deserve judgment, wrath, and condemnation. You don't deserve mercy. You don't deserve grace. I think the two concepts work hand in hand. All right, we're already at 31 minutes, all right? Um, here we go. We're going to read this whole paragraph. We're not making it too far, okay? We're not making it too far. But there's a lot of, uh, look, there's a lot of good stuff here. This is, man, the, I have a, I really do have a hard time with this. I have a hard time that, hey, if I want to talk about the pastor in Canada and him being arrested and offer my hot, my quote unquote hot take on it that made so many people mad. Oh, look at the number of downloads I've gotten about my discussion about what's happening in Canada. But this is the kind of stuff that you really wish people would be like, whoa, that's good stuff. This, what we just talked about, this is gold. This is spiritual gold. This is like, this is worth $100. I mean, $1,000. This is some good stuff. Not because I'm smart. It's because Thomas Akempis just brings these things to the surface that just gives us so many things to think about. So let's read this whole paragraph. This is the first paragraph of chapter 21. Let's read this whole thing. If you will make any progress, keep yourself in the fear of God. If you're truly going to make progress in your Christian life, you have to fear God. And affect not too much liberty, but restrain all your senses under discipline and give not yourself over to foolish mirth. So we have to ask ourselves, how does foolish amusement combat our fear of God? But at the same time, we need to be warned, right? That we can, we, listen, we cannot engage in too much liberty. We can restrain all of our senses under discipline. We can, we can refrain from foolish mirth, but if we're not careful, all of these good things will not actually keep us in the fear of God. These can become the very source of spiritual pride. And the minute we begin to have pride about it, and I gave some examples of how people kind of demonstrate this pride, you're no longer fearing God, even though you're doing the right thing. In fact, doing the right thing is now becoming a spiritual stumbling block in your own life. Give yourself to contrition of heart and you shall find devotion. Give yourself to the contrition of heart and note you will find devotion. If you want true devotion in your spiritual life, if you want, you've got to give yourself to contrition. And again, fear of God leads to contrition. Contrition leads to the fear of God. It's a circle, all right? And then last sentence. Contrition lays open many good things which distraction is want quickly to destroy. Contrition lays open many good things. If you're contrite and hard, if you truly experience contrition in your spiritual life, it's going to lay open many good things. A lot of good spiritual things are going to come from it. However, this is distraction is want quickly to destroy. Distraction will try to destroy these good things. You cannot become distracted from fearing God or from contrition. 
Distraction will take away. Distraction will say, hey, don't focus on your sin. Don't focus on being broken over your sin. Don't focus on fearing God. You're going to become distracted. You're going to be like, look at this and look at that. And Christians get distracted by so many things. We get distracted by amusement, gossip, slander, other people's failure, controversy. We get distracted by so many things and it will literally destroy our contrition. We need contrition. All right, I'm going to stop right there. Do I have... Let me look. I'm gonna. I got a Bible dictionary here. I'm gonna look something up really quick. I'm gonna look something up here. Give me one second. I di- I just I didn't think of it, but let me look at it. Contrite. Okay. They do have an entry for contrite. Uh, contrite. The kind of spirit or heart pleasing and acceptable to God. Contrite, crushed, I guess is how it's uh, translated in some uh, scripture. People who have contrite spirit weep over wrongdoing and express genuine sorrow for their sins. People who have a contrite spirit. Do you have a contrite spirit? They have a, they, uh, they offer up Psalm 34, 18. Let me look, let me grab my Bible here. A second, Psalm 34, 18. Psalm 34, 18. This is a very powerful concept here. Psalm 34, 18. Yeah, here we go. Psalm, uh, Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. That the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Are you, do you, are you, do you fear God and do you have a contrite heart, a broken, or as they say, a contrite spirit as the way it says in the King James. Do you have, do you, have you felt contrition? Have, truly feel that. Do you feel, truly feel the weight of your sin? Sometimes the only time we feel the weight of our sin is when it's big, when it's scandalous, when people find out. But you're you're in a constant state of sin. We got to feel that contrite heart, which will lead us to fear God. And the more we fear God, the more we'll have a contrite heart. We need both if we're going to advance in our spiritual life. There's so much more I could say, but I just think I I threw out, man, I think I was just throwing out pieces of, of gold right there. I think there was... I think there was some some serious gold there for you to think about and uh, consider. And I would love to get your thoughts on all of that. We'll get back to, we'll, 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 on our next study, we'll try to make it through this whole chapter. But that first paragraph is super powerful, all right? Contrite of heart, yes, contrition of heart, Thomas Akempis. Now remember, um, on the Theology Central pod page, Theology Central pod page, if you, if you go to episodes, it'll give you a little drop-down menu. It'll show you all the different series, and you'll see the series for the Imitation of Christ, and you can go back and listen to every episode. If there's an episode you don't like or you think I need to go back and fix, let me know. I can't guarantee that I will, but uh, I'll, maybe I will we'll revisit and do just an additional teaching on whatever uh, thing you, you think I didn't do well on. But uh, there you have it. There you have it. I'm asking. That's some powerful stuff. That's some powerful stuff. Yeah. All right. Everyone, uh, I'll just email me if you want. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. I think I just, I feel like I need to say something powerful at the end, but I, I really, in some ways, I don't. I just want to stop right there because that was a lot to process, and I'll wait and hear from you, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll, hopefully we'll spark uh, some interesting conversations. All right, I'll stop right there. Everyone have a great day. God bless.